we don't talk about these stories. It's not fun um, to share these stories, but there are a lot of times where we're brought in to sell companies where the owners are sick or unfortunately dying. And I think even taking a step back from that, I think this is just an important conversation to have. In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to The Deal Board. And we have a very special episode for you today. We're wrapping up the year, wrapping up 2022. It's talking about legacy and estate planning. So thinking long-term today. Yeah, you know, this just came up in a deal that we were working on, and it was a very sad situation. And we often, this happens more than we like to for it to happen, where a seller is sick, and they pass away during the process. And we are shocked to find out that they don't have their affairs in order. And what happens is the probate process takes time, much like any legal process. And if you don't have the shares of your business, you don't have the accounts, you don't have the vendor, all the things that we're going to talk about today with Deborah Carmen and your guest, uh, if you don't have those in place, it's going to take too much time for us to transfer that, go through the probate process, and have the buyer wait. This deal was supposed to close in the next couple of weeks, and it just, the business evaporated. The heirs will get no value from this business. Yeah, and and you know what? Unfortunately, it's happened in our office too, Andy. And I think we we don't talk about these stories. It's not fun um, to share these stories, but there are a lot of times where we're brought in to sell companies where the owners are sick or unfortunately dying. And I think even taking a step back from that, I think this is just an important conversation to have because you never, we never know what's going to happen to us, right? And and ideally, these types of affairs should be arranged for way early in a business relationship, not just because we're being brought in to sold the, sell the company, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, <laughs> I'm still working on updating my affairs as well. And, you know, because, you know, things change over time too. If you think you have your affairs in order, you may not. So this episode has some great interviews. We interviewed Deborah Carmen, uh, and we also, and who we've all interviewed before, and she has some great advice because again, she's been part of these deals where the the um, estate issues and legacy issues come into play. And then we're off also a longtime attorney here in South Florida, Ben Pratano. And we're just talking about some of the other general things that happen during deals. And Ben's a great guy, uh, has been doing this for a long time. And uh, I also get an IBBA update uh, from Randy Bring, the chair, and of course, uh, the executive director. Uh, from the IBBA. So looking forward to talking to everybody. Yeah, always great to have them all on. Um, love having Deborah and Randy on the show whenever we can. I interview Nick Rudden. He's a partner at Goodspeed and Merrill. And our conversation, if so, if this, the scary stuff um, doesn't motivate you to get your affairs in order, Nick and I talk about um, tax reasons that you want to have estate and legacy planning done in your business. And um, obviously there's tax implications of how we set up companies for transition, not just in a sale, but in, in the event that something would happen to us as well, too. So um, that's my interviews for today. I know we've got some great advice on the show. This is not um, the fun like marketing topic that we would talk about, about growing your business through marketing, but it's super necessary and really good this time of year just to think through those long-term strategic planning issues. Yep, let's get to it because we have a lot of interviews to get through. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And we are talking about estate planning and businesses. 
something that nobody ever wants to talk about. But this came up recently in a couple of deals uh, that we were working on. And it's a real problem. And it's pretty, it's not simple to fix, but it's certainly something you could plan on and, and, and work on it. And so with that, I'm going to bring in the deal expert herself, Deborah Carmen from Carmen Law here in Boca Raton, Florida, who has done many, many deals with us. And Deborah, you know, let's start off by just talking about some of the stories we have that people weren't ready for this, and it really causes a problem. No, thank you, Andy. And yes, it does cause a problem because, as we all know, time can be a real killer of deals. And if something unfortunately happens where someone is either in a hospital and cannot sign, is incapacitated, and things are not done properly, or someone has passed away, then the business is just like any other property owned by someone. If you don't have an actual will, trust, or vehicle to go ahead and, and see how you can make the transfer, uh, then everything is up to a court. And when you start dealing with a court and probate and you start dealing with the time it takes for personal representatives to be appointed and the time it takes for the estate to go through and any taxes to be paid uh, and to get permission to sell a business and to have a valuation done in a business to be able to have permission to sell it. And that's assuming that there's even a will. So it becomes very complicated off of something that's very easy to fix. And I think what people have to do when they walk into buying a business, they have to start thinking, not, gee, what happens if I'm, I'm 85 years old and now I want to give the business to a child? They have to do like any other responsible planning. What do I do now? So if something happens you know, to me, is it going to go to my husband, my wife? Uh, do I want it to go to my children? Do I have other partners involved? All these questions need to be answered pretty quickly when you buy a business. And then, and then it's a very easy fix because you either put it to a trust or a will, or you figure how we're going to do this or how you're going to title assets with your wife, your spouse. Uh, you can do all types of creative planning through operating agreements. I bet you that our listeners out there, if they have a, you know, a personally owned small business, do not even have either an operating agreement for that business or a shareholders agreement. And both of those are excellent vehicles for people to pass, uh, you know, a property, pass uh, other items such as uh, stock, membership interests without probate. And that's what we're all looking to do. We're looking not to have to go to court. Yeah, I mean, it's a nightmare. Obviously, time kills all deals. We've talked about it many, many times. And we've seen it. And it's it's incredible that, you know, we've seen people who are really sick. And they yes. know that they're dying and they still don't do anything. And we're in the middle of a deal and something bad happens. Like you said, you know, listen, we've had some closings yes. inside the hospital where we've been, you know, yeah. like at least the person was of right mind and able to sign something. We've had to go to the hospital to have people sign things. But, yes. you know, as you know, uh, that could, that could be a problem. And we've had a couple of deals fall through because mo money dries up. They don't have access to the bank accounts. It's, it's, it's bad. It really is bad. And sometimes even though someone is able to sign, they're not in their right sense of mind. So while someone is in the, uh, the sense of mind to make proper planning, do it then as opposed to in an emergency situation. Uh, but even in these emergency situations, I've had situations where we've been in the middle of a contract, ready to close, one day before closing, and uh, the person who owns the business dies. Now what do I do? He didn't leave the wife on anything. So now I have a situation where I have to go back and the family has to open probate. They're not on uh, sun, what we call sun biz. They're not on division of corporations. There's no continuity of this business. And it's a real problem because that buyer wants to be in that business immediately. So what do you do? Then you have to go through a whole list of gyrations uh, to get this done before you go through probate court. And then you have to go through probate court to get everything finally cleaned up. So it makes the best sense, period. Someone says, hey, there's a husband and wife over here. You can leave it in the operating agreement uh, as remainder men. You know, you can have tenancy by the entireties as far as how you hold your shares. There's so many different things you can do. You can put it into a trust. You can take your membership interest, put them into a trust, 
and then you don't have to worry about probate. And you have to think about it again. It's all the same. It's not taxed any differently at that point. There's nothing you can do in that report at that point. And then later on, you can do some planning over there and say, I want a child to take this on. And, and people have to think very carefully too. And you know, and I know too, Andy, that many times people think their son or daughter can run this business and they can't, or they don't want to. So that people have to come to realization quickly enough and say, gee, I have to get my business in position. So anything happens to me, it can be sold. It's not going to go to that child. So um, there's a lot of planning, a lot of forethought that goes into that. Uh, I had one where uh, the person was, was really incapacitated, couldn't sign, but lived for another three or four months. Mm. Even, even the worst situation, because at that point, there was nothing really that could be done. Um, there was no ability for them to sign. And people say to me all the time, can I use a power of attorney after death? No. And if you didn't hmm. have the right to even, you know, incapacitated at that point in time, a durable power of attorney, you also have an issue and a problem with the business. So wow. it's such an easy fix to do to go on and make sure that your, your spouse is either on the company with you or that you've done estate planning properly. Right. So, uh, so it sounds like, you know, first of all, how long does probate usually take? I mean, I'm sure it's different everywhere, but. Probate could take, uh, it could take months up to a year. And yeah. at that point, you also pay on what is in the estate. You're paying an attorney and you have to rely upon the judge to present an order for you to sell a business. You have to go right. to court for that. Everything has to be appointed. There's contests where if you're, if you're not doing this properly, children never seem to be happy with what their parents are leaving, which is another issue. Because if you want to leave, even you want to leave a business to one child and not the other child, you don't do it properly, that becomes an issue. So you, you really have to carefully plan with an attorney that handles that for you and make sure that you have what you need, all the tools in the toolbox to make it as easy as possible for the surviving spouse or the children. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, we've seen a lot of businesses uh upon the death and if it has to go to probate there's just nothing to sell because you just can't get through that process and like you said people aren't on bank accounts people can't can't transfer uh contracts uh you know we have lease issues there's all kinds of things that come into play so it sounds like the sensible thing is you buy a business you make sure that somebody else is on the sun biz or i mean on the corporation with you at some point uh yes. and, and you have and you immediately get some um some estate planning done exactly or even something as simple as doing your operating agreement you can go to your corporate attorney and get that done in your operating agreement if it's an llc you can go to the business attorney if it's for shareholders and, and how you're going to hold that stock so, because anything held as tenancy by the entireties is, is obviously it goes, you know, survivor. So there's so many different ways that are easy to do. You don't have to think about it again. And if there is no spouse and there is no one in that sense, then you have to think, what am I doing over here? Who's this going to? And then you can have a huge partnership situation where you have to spell everything out. That's why we do these buy-sell agreements. If you've seen, and I know you've seen countless ones of those where you have to look carefully at what you, when you sell to make sure there's not a partner on over there that has to be notified. Uh, and that's all in your buy sell provisions in your shareholders agreements. Right. So how many times have you seen a, a, a business owner die and they go to sell the business and they didn't do all the right things and they're still trying to sell the business? I have, I, it's very sad ahead. for me because what happens is I have the widow will call me. And she'll say, you know, my husband passed away. Um, I have a contract. What can I do over here to make sure that I can sell this business? And by that point, you're underwater because you can't run the business. You're not on a bank account. You have no ability to deal with contracts. You really have no ability to deal with anything. And if it's a medical practice or a practice that prohibits a, a lay person from doing it, uh, or even if it's something where you, you need a qualifier, if someone's not familiar with the business, they're left basically maybe with many debts without any income. And there's no yeah. way for a business sale really to go through in a proper sense. And by the time the business sale does go through, you're not selling the same business. 
Yeah, you brought up a good point. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into a business. I mean, key man insurance would be a good thing to try to help the business along. Uh, so, and insurance is very inexpensive unless you're uh, old or, you know, very sick. But a lot of times when you're getting into business, you're usually not sick or you're not old, uh, right. uh, old enough not to be able to afford a term policy to, you know, cover your business at least. So, you know, get some money into your business so it can run. And then the other thing is, like you said, uh, there's a lot of other things that come into play. Expertise in the business. You just brought up another great point, licensing in the business. If you're a contractor or even me, like I'm a, I'm a business broker and I have to have a broker's license. I have to have somebody ready to jump in to put their brokerage license on the business because everybody that, you know, works underneath you would then be, uh, you know, would not be licensed. So the business has to be licensed pretty quickly. So there's a lot of things that go into, you know, just proper estate planning and, and just trying to keep that value because you and I both know that uh, people will revalue a business up to the day of closing. Right. And people, I hate to say it, but you know, and I know will take advantage of the situation. So it yep. all has to be done in a proper fashion. Otherwise, they will look at it, assess it and say, well, here's what we're going to do for you to take it off your hands. So, which is not necessarily the proper way to sell the business. So you have that in mind. And it's like I said, it's a very easy fix, but there's also a lot of people that go into business together. You have a lot of different couples that go into partnerships. You have, uh, you have family members that go in. Um, I've seen where there's been six or eight different types of family members over there, but they don't want this one to have this part or this one to do the business. And they don't want to make sure that when they die, the business doesn't go to them. So this is where all this takes place, not even in estate planning, but takes place in planning with your operating agreement, your buy-sell provisions, and to make sure everything is laid out properly. You have the right insurance you talked about, which was excellent, Annie, having you know, life insurance on someone, just to make sure that you're not going to now be stuck in a business with someone you can't run it with. Yeah. I mean, you know, operating agreements. I You mentioned it before, and I meant to make that point. Out of all the businesses that we sell, and we're selling hundreds, thousands of businesses now, but, you know, personally, I've seen hundreds and hundreds here in Florida. I've seen very, very few operating agreements. I mean, if maybe 5%, I, I, I'm not even sure to reach 5%. And, and if you look at someone, it's a, it's a closed business, it's someone belonging to a husband and wife, they're never going to have it. They're never going to spend the money doing it. And they won't do it properly um, or they'll go on uh, legal zoom or go on something over there to fill the form out and it'll be an issue for them so there's there's all kinds of, of problems that could come about from that that just you know a very simple solution go to an attorney have it done properly and you're done don't have to think yeah. about it again doing a will or doing a trust yeah it's uh yeah. certainly something to have on your checklist when you're gut when you're in business to make sure that uh, you can make sure that it, the, whoever you're leaving the business to has the capacity to run it. And of course, when you're in a deal, I mean, if you're in a deal, even if you're gonna, you think you're listing your business for sale, certainly, I know a lot of business brokers listen to this, certainly a great question to ask your sellers um, during the process, especially if it's a valuable business. It's like, do you have your estate planning in order? And if you don't, we need to do that now because we can lose all the value of your business between now and the time it sells. And we're right at the end. Here we are. And I mean, what does it cost? I mean, it's not going to cost a ton of money to get this done. No, no. And that's why SBA, SBA gets collateral and, you know, assignment of life insurance to protect their investment. It is no different. It's an investment you're making. You need to protect yourself, whether it's by insurance or by any other means to make sure that you keep that value of that business. And yeah. we've had SB bills too. Afterwards, someone has passed away, you know, and they don't know what to do because they can't run the business. They don't want to do anything over here. And SBA has the insurance. So you you really you really have to think about all different facets. And you know that business, that's what I love about business, because business has so many different things that happen. There's right. so many different you know, parts to it. All the moving parts in a business are so different than real estate or anything else. Right. Well. And 
All great points. Is there anything you want to wrap this up with? Uh, the only thing I would suggest is that the people, when they write these, okay, and they go that far, look at it again and make sure you keep it current. And what I find too, which is so interesting from trust, people will take a trust and they'll write everything out in that trust specifically for the deal. They'll write it out for everything they have. And then they forget to put the actual shares into the trust. Or they forgot to put any of the, uh, the stocks into the trust, okay? So here you have a beautiful document that's no and nothing more than a will. Right. And people don't seem to fund their trust. And they don't update either. So it's, it's very important to keep current on the law. It's very important also to make sure with your business that if you can save taxes by doing something when you pass it on to a child or you, you do something in that respect, that you have that advantage. Because now, of course, things are changing in the tax world. And as you get to bigger deals, you know, things that were not going to be taxed before for estate taxes, you're going to wind up paying them down the road. Yep. You know, are you able to gift anything to a child? What, what are you doing now? Are you putting a child in a management position? Um, I spoke to, to actually someone just uh, the other day that said to me that their son, who's been running the business for a long period of time, they don't believe that when they pass away and when their manager passes away that he can run the business. Yeah, so that's, it, that's, that's, you know, it's kind of like it hits you, you know, really, really hard because what do you do in that respect? How do you tell that person earning a substantial income down the road? Guess what? You're done. So right. you have to plan and plan really what, what you have to do there. And a lot of the clients that we deal with make sure that when the buyer comes in, those children are kept in that business, you know, whether they're kept through exclusive agreements or whatever, or severance, you know, if they let them go, uh, there's always things that can be done. So you can have the best of all worlds. They don't have to own it, but they can certainly be taken care of. Again, great advice uh, from Deborah. And if someone wants to get in touch with you to talk more, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is to give me a call at 561-392-7031, or you can always go ahead and, uh, and visit our website, www.carmenlegal.com. I look okay. forward to helping anybody with this because this is something no one really should have to go through. They should not have to go through it. And we just saw it happen recently in a deal. And we see That's it over right. and over again. And we don't want that to happen to you. So folks, take uh, this advice and give Deborah a call. Deborah, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Having me on over here. I really appreciate that. And uh, anyone who has a question, I'm here to do it. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It is deal of the week. And we have Julie Smith here from Transworld Business Advisors of Central Oregon. And Julie, you had a nice deal sell. Yes, we did this week. A company that deals in concrete, polishing, um, dyeing. You know, you see it a lot in big warehouse stores, um, sometimes restaurants. And it's a lucrative business. And this guy was bringing in a lot of cash, which we didn't even include but making almost 300,000, um, yeah, we, we don't include that, uh, making almost 300,000 in SDE and we sold it for 750 and uh, it ran through SBA. Nice, made nice. It through. <laughs> and um, they, it's just two peas in a pod. You had a, an army guy selling to a Navy guy and they're super happy. Oh, they got along even? They got along great. So it's good deals for good people. Exactly. They're super happy. Excellent. So it sounds like a great deal and uh, construction pretty big out here. So people It is, are, yes. So the good future for the buyer. For sure. Excellent. So what's the best way to get in touch with you if somebody else wants to sell something like that? Uh, J Smith, that letter J, Smith at tworld.com. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And I am with Kylene Golubsky from Trans, uh, Trans World, from the IBBA, the International <laughs> Business Brokers. Right, right, right. <laughs> the International Business Brokers Association, the executive director. You've been there for a while now. How long has it been? Since, since 2015. Time flies. Yeah, time does fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are so excited 
about the IBBA because it has grown over the last few years. Incredibly. Remarkable. Yeah. In uh, 2015, we have about 560 members. Now we have 2,700 members. Right. So big, a big part of that was reaching out to some of the local associations mm-hmm. and getting them to join one of them. We are here at the uh, BBF conference. Yes. I got to get all my initials right. And uh, we uh, became members of the IBBA through our membership at the BBF now. Yeah, you know, we've long felt that the business broker is best supported through a combination of what the IBBA can do, and but then also what the state or regional groups can do and do better than, than us. But us, you know, those two things put together really gives the business broker the best support and education uh, to feel their success. Yeah, and there's no better education than the IBBA getting your CBI or Certified mm-hmm. Business Intermediary. And we have a conference coming up uh, in 2023 yeah, in big May. One. A big one. I, I am going to say this is going to be the biggest um, IBBA conference ever. I think it will be. I think that the, my recollection of a huge conference was in Reno in like, 2000 something. I have no idea what that was. It was a long time ago. I've been here too many years. You know, I was counting. I've been to about 40 uh, IBBA conferences. We used to do them twice a year. Now we do them once. Once a year. Yeah. And uh, it is absolutely worth coming to. And if you are service business brokers or do financing, you really need to be there too. We have an excellent uh, vendor. We do. Expo. We do. Yeah. Exhibitor opportunities, sponsorship opportunities. It is the largest gathering of business brokers in one place in the world at any given time. And there's no other uh, event or venue to go to where you can meet as many people and form as many relationships. And we are, we're expanding internationally as well. Yeah. We have some international folks show up. Uh, I know our own Henry Ziff uh, has, has showed up to Denver. Yes. And so, and he'll, I know he'll be in Orlando as well. And we're looking for other countries to join us as well. We are, uh, we had folks from the Australian uh, Business Brokerage Association, New Zealand as well represented. And we have a new partnership this year with um, an association called Transeo. And so we'll be releasing more information about that, but that's really going to help folks that want to do more cross-border transactions. Uh, that's an area we haven't provided a lot of support historically. Now we're going to be able to do that. And we're doing more deals, even nationally, internationally. We're seeing it. I mean, with Zoom and with, uh, and Monty was just talking about it. We had a speaker, Monty Walker, and uh, and it was somebody else, I think, last night was talking about the mainstreaming of people by growing through acquisition. Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, all the um, the boundaries Right, you know, existed there are starting to come down, and yeah, it's sure. just creating so much more opportunity for everyone. Right, and so it, it has been an incredible business. You know, speaking of, you know, why did we have 500 uh, members about five years ago? And of course, the economic downturn certainly impacted our industry as a whole. And uh, we have been, I, I would say, since approximately 2000, you know. 11, 12 for the last decade, it has come roaring back, perhaps a little bit of a break because of COVID. Uh, uh, you, you know, it's crazy, it, at least from the IBBA standpoint, our membership, our membership grew by 12% during that COVID year. Yeah. And I think a lot of people just realized more than ever that um, I, I can't be isolated and be successful in this business. I need community. I need support. I need to exchange ideas. So we saw growth. Yeah. I, and I, again, I, I'm a big advocate for continuing your education. Uh, and, and I'm a big advocate for people getting together and supporting the industry. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I've worked very closely with my quote unquote competitors. I don't see them as competitors. I think the people who don't know what business brokerage is, is our competitor. That's, competition. that's our, that's the competition. Uh, you know, we often speculate, what percentage of deals out there in the world do you think are done without business brokers or f- with business brokers? And I hear all kinds of things, 20, yeah. 30, 40. I really do think it's probably in, maybe in the 30s if we're lucky. You know, I think that's the data point we all wish we had that right. we knew with certainty. But I think what we can all say is that it's lower than what it should be. Right. And that um, business sellers, business buyers are, are not getting the best deal. 
um, having the best experience when they're not working with an advisor. I agree. I agree. We have a lot to do, a lot of work to do in our industry to continue to promote it, not only to people inside of our industry, but obviously business owners, uh, universities, people that are in the investment arena, banking arena, uh, that we're here to help their clients. You know, if I can take a moment, this we have something exciting coming up that I want to share with you. Please. I don't even think you know about this, but we are for the first time going to conduct a, a research study with business owners to try and learn exactly why they're not using a business hmm. intermediary. Interesting. Um, we all sort of have our guesses and right. our, our anecdotal insights, but you know, is it that um, that they don't know what the it is? Exists? Sure. Um, is it? Oh, I, I can do it myself. Is it right. uh, my my lawyer or CPA can do that? And I think when we learn that with um, some greater certainty, what it's going to allow us to do at the IBBA is craft the right message, and then also learn, you know, how business owners are and taking their information now, get that message in the right place, so we can continue just raising that awareness level uh, with business owners and related parties, but business owners that hey, you need to work with a business intermediary when it comes time to transition. Yeah, I think we're starting to gather that's those statistics as well. Like what is what does it look like when you sell through an intermediary as far as earnings, uh the multiples? What is what does it look like in time? What you know, and I think we're starting to gather that and showing how beneficial it is to oh, use yeah. an intermediary. And I think with you know Part of the IBBA's job is getting that out there to the world. Absolutely. That's part of the reason we exist is to do that. Excellent. So if somebody wanted to learn more about the IBBA, what's the best way? I would say go to our website, IBBA.org. Lots of information there. You can access um, online courses, information about upcoming events. Uh, if you want to learn more about the CBI designation. And then all of our contact information is up there as well. So if you have a question, just call us at the headquarters. Thank you, Kylene. Thank, Thank you. you Andy. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for listing of the week. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It is listing of the week, and we are speaking with Jason Blair from Transworld Business Advisors of Portland. Jason, you got a good deal. Yeah, we got a brand new deal. It's a cabinet manufacturer, been around for 46 years. Um, it's a great listing. Excited about it. So tell us how much it is, how much SDE. Give us a little background. We're at 1.9 as a list price. Uh, we've got about 473 SDE and um, inventory is around 700,000. And we've got FF&E around a uh, million dollars worth of uh, inventory. Uh, sorry, FF&E. So. Yeah, well, I've seen some of those sell in the past. We have sold those businesses Very in the asset best. Heavy. Yeah, asset, asset heavy. heavy. Yeah, asset heavy. Yeah, a lot of assets, but it's been around for a long time. Yeah, and and the good thing is, is uh, we've got Live Oak up here now, and uh, Aaron Rayota. Yeah. So we floated it by him, and um, we're, you know we're still working on it, but great resource to have as well. All right, Jason, sounds like a good deal. If somebody wants to learn more, what's the best way to get in touch with you? It's Jason Blair. It's jblair at tworld.com. And my uh, direct line is 763-269-1979. Excellent. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And I have the Ben Pratano from Trent, uh, from, from PratanoLaw.com. Yeah. And he is infamous because his family also owned a very famous bakery in Hollywood, Florida, my current hometown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not only does Ben know the law, which is great because he works with uh, <laughs> business brokers, including the legendary Ken Stebbins, but his family also owned a small business. So he knows his way in and around small business and small business deals, right? Yeah, that is 100% correct. So you're doing a I'm lot of putting these deals together. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, you know, we were talking about legal matters and, you know, it, whenever times get tight or, uh, you know, uh, it seems like people run out of things to try to sue for, uh, <laughs> they look for things. So they start, sometimes they even fabricate things. So. Right. Yeah. I've, I've just been noticing some of the trends lately with, uh, I don't, I don't want to say newer counsel coming in, but maybe less seasoned counsel who have, maybe they haven't been a part of a lot of different transactions. 
Um, and they, whether they get involved too early in the transaction or their client is re, uh, relying on them too heavily, but uh, they start to look for things like uh, when you start to come back with a something that they're trying to negotiate, you try to bring clarity and they mistake that clarity. And next thing you know, they want to threaten with lawsuits and litigation or breach of contract or just, you know, any of those fun things that really make your stomach turn. Yeah. So take a step back because I think this is a really important point you made right before we got on camera was that you really need the right attorney in yes. these deals. Yes. Um, you know, my advice to people, of course, I want everyone to hire me, <laughs> Ben Protano at protanolaw.com. <laughs> exactly. And of course, I want everyone to hire me, but, and, but I don't ever put pressure on anyone. And I always tell them in our conversation, whether they're the broker or whether it's a, a buyer or seller that's coming to me, is that just you know make sure that the the business person is the one that built the company they're the one who needs to really control the negotiation it's their transaction sure. sometimes the overzealous counselor gets involved and they start to say well you don't need to do that and you shouldn't take that and you should get more or you should do this and the next thing you know your deal is either falling apart doesn't get off the ground or you wind up in litigation yeah i, I find that a lot with counselors who aren't familiar with the normal the usual kind of tenants of a of a small business transaction is they'll overreach or they'll over negotiate certain points that are just not reasonable not reasonable and sometimes they'll start to go on this uh, on this tangent that doesn't even make sense and it may not even really be impactful on the transaction but in their mind it is, and maybe they, I, I had one recently, maybe the, maybe the attorney built it up in their client's mind to be something bigger than it was. And it, again, turns into a deal killer. Yeah. And it, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's why we love working with people like you, Ben, because you, you know what should be in a deal and what shouldn't yeah. be in a deal. And listen, I, I've always told all the attorneys we work with, we absolutely want both sides well represented. Definitely. We want good deals for good people, as we say. Definitely. And, you know, we don't want litigation later because exactly. that is certainly something nobody wants. Exactly. I mean, you could eat up all of your, all of this great deal that you just made and you've got all this uh, money sitting there ready to go into your next venture or whatever you had set aside and it starts getting eat, eaten up by legal fees and that, uh, uh, or damages, you know, and then you have to buy your way out. I mean, it's, it, it is ridiculous. Right. So the best thing to do is to have the right paperwork in place. The course, right, right paperwork, uh, open communication, uh, make sure that the business person is in control of their own destiny. It is their transaction after all. And you mentioned Ken Stebbins. I have to give a lot of credit to Ken Stebbins. And, um, I, you know, as a child, really child growing up in the 70s and Ken Stebbins working uh, with our parents' company on uh it was, you know, it, it, it might seem trivial to some, but it was bread route sales. Yeah, it, I and, remember uh, Ken did a ton of them. Yes, and uh, Ken uh, Ken um, introduced me to an attorney back then because at the age of, I want to say about 19 or 20, I was writing the distribution agreements. And uh, so Ken had introduced me to an attorney and somebody at that point, I don't know if it was Ken or that attorney said, oh, you should you write to the Department of State Division of Corporations and they'll send you uh, booklets on the corporate laws. And I said, well, that's funny. I did it. And I used to get them updated every year. And I never knew I was going to be an attorney. I didn't have any thoughts of going to law school, but it, it really evolved. And I really enjoyed working with Ken uh, throughout his career yeah. and mine. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm going into my 23rd year. Wow. Um, it's only been five years since Ken hasn't been with us. Yes. And uh, I, I had the extreme pleasure of working with him on his very last, what would be his last transaction, unbeknownst yeah, to all of us. I mean, Ken, I always say if they built a Mount Rushmore of business brokerage, <laughs> Ken is absolutely one of the yes. faces. He's literally changed the way we did business yes. with his MLS and Florida is by far again, because of co-brokerage and because of Ken and the people that were there at the time in the you know early 80s, late 70s, like you said, yeah. uh, had the foresight to say, listen, we need an open marketplace for buyers and sellers to go out there and transact in businesses. And it's been wildly successful. I keep pointing out to all the other states in the union that they really need to adopt a model like, uh, like sure. Florida. And you know, having transaction attorneys like yourself be able to 
you know, I always, again, want buyers and sellers to have counsel. We want to get these deals done right. We, like you said, you don't want deal killers, but you want deal protectors. That's it. That's it. And it's, it's very, uh, it's a tough and competitive market on the legal end. Right. Um, so there's, there are plenty of attorneys out there who do have good experience who can be facilitators right. in getting your transaction complete. Well, and it's nice that you have your own family office because a lot of the big law firms just can't afford to work on these deals either. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you have the, you're more of an entrepreneur. You came from an entrepreneurial yeah. background and, and you have the ability to work on these deals. Sure. And, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, big firms don't want to take a transaction where their fee is going to wind up being $2,500 or in that ballpark. Uh, right. So that you have to take an emotional standpoint as I do and say, right. I can see elements of our family business in your business and I can see why this is so important to you and I'm going to help no matter what. Right. I always tell people when they come to my office, be careful because if you want this deal done, I'm going to get it done for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's what everybody wants usually. Yeah. Uh, you know, unless they find something bad, which of course yes. we do want to find things you, bad. Yeah. And you have to know up front. Right. The good, the bad, the ugly, right. and the crazy. And the crazy. And we've <laughs> seen plenty of crazy. And if you want to battle crazy and want to contact Ben, Ben, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, I, I definitely say my email, which is bp at protanolaw.com, P-R-O-T-A-N-O-L-A-W.com, or go to my website and read my background. It's simply protanolaw.com. You do a great service. Thank you, Ben, Thank so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It is Listing of the Week, and we have Lonnie Woodruff here from Transworld Business Advisors of Central Oregon. Tell me, you got a good listing, and you just said what it was, and I don't know what it is. It's a ready-mix batch plant in beautiful Central Oregon. It's been in business for over 20 years and uh, makes just lots of money. It's probably our best price listing we have in our entire office. So tell me how much it's going for. Last year it made 944,000 and we're asking 2.35 million, it includes real estate as well. Wow, so that sounds like a really good deal. Is the owner retiring? The owner is retiring after a good long run. Wow, and so uh, what kind of buyer are you looking for? Strategic or maybe is someone interested in construction? I mean, I don't think construction's slowing down here for any time soon. Construction's not slowing down here at all. With everybody working remotely and everything like that, uh, Ben's becoming, uh, in Central Oregon's kind of becoming a hub for all a bunch of people just working remote and living the, the good life here in the High Cascades. Excellent. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you about this listing, what's the best way? Give me a call, 541-920-9026. Excellent. Thanks, Lonnie. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.